Ashley Brock, Rainey, Nora Roberts' book, Anna Harbor, Chapter 7. Seth didn't mind running hurt on Aubrey. She was kind of his niece now that Ethan and Grace were married. Being an uncle made him feel adult and responsible. Besides, all she really wanted to do was race around the yard. Every time he threw a ball or a stick for one of the dogs, she went into gales of laughter. Guy couldn't help but get a kick out of it. She was pretty cute, too, with her curly gold hair and her big green eyes that looked amazed at everything he did. Spending an hour or two on a Sunday interview entertaining her wasn't a bad deal. He hadn't forgotten where he had been a year ago. There'd been no big backyard that fell off into the water, no woods to explore, no dogs to wrestle with, no little girl who looked at him like he was Fox Mulder. All the Power Rangers and Superman rolled into one, <laughs> said there's been grungy rooms, three flights up from the streets, and those streets had been a dark carnival at night, a place where everything had its price, sex, drugs, weapons, misery. He learned that no matter what went on in those grudgy rooms, he shouldn't go out after dark. There'd been no one to care if he was clean or fed, if he was sick or scared. He'd never felt like a hero there, or even very much like a kid. He felt like a thing, and he'd learned quickly that things are often hunted. Gloria had ridden all the rides in that carnival again and again. She'd brought the freaks and the hustlers into those rooms, selling herself to whoever would pay the price of her next spin. A year ago, Seth hadn't believed his life would ever be anything different. Then Ray came and took him to the house by the water. Ray showed him a different world and promised he would never have to go back to the old one. Ray had died, but he had kept his promise all the same. Now Seth could stand in the big backyard with water lapping at its edges and throw balls and sticks for the dogs to chase with an angel-faced toddler laughed. Seth, let me, let me, Aubrey danced on her sturdy little legs, holding up both hands for the mangy ball. Okay, you throw it. He grinned while she screwed up her face with concentration and effort. The ball bounced inches away from the toes of her bright red sneakers. Simon snapped it up, making her squeal with delight, then politely offered it back. Oh, good ducky! I'll be patting the patient Simon on either side of his jaw, angling for affection. Foolish nudged his way in, shoved her down on her butt. She rewarded him with a fierce hug. Now you, she ought to say, you do it. Obliging her, Seth wiggled the ball. He laughed at as the dogs raced after, bumping their bodies like two football players rushing downfield. They crashed into the woods, sending a pair of birds squawking skyward. That moment, when I'll be bouncing with giggles, the dogs barking, the fresh September air on his cheeks, Seth was completely happy. Part of his mind focused on it, snatched it at it. It to keep. The angle of the sun, the brilliance of light on the water, the creamy sound of Otis reading drifting through the kitchen window, the bitchy complaints of the birds in the rich, salty scent of the bay. He was home. Then the putt of a motor caught his attention. When he turned, he saw the familiar, the family slope angling in toward the dock. At the wheel, Philip raised a hand in greeting. Even as Seth returned the wave, his gaze shifted to the woman standing beside Philip. It felt as if something brushed over the nap of his neck. Light and cage, he has the legs of a spider. Absolutely rubbed at it, shrugged his shoulders, then took Aubrey firmly by the hand. Remember, you have to stay in the middle of the dock. She gazed up at him adoringly. Okay, I will. Mama says never, never go by wild by myself. That's right. He stepped onto the dock with her and waited for Philip to come alongside. It was a woman who awkwardly tossed him the bowline. Sibyl or something, he thought for a moment as she balanced herself. As their eyes met, he felt that sly tickle on the nap of his neck again. Then the dogs were bounding onto the dock and Abby was laughing again. Hey, angel baby. Philip helped Sibyl step onto the dock and winked out at Abby. Up, she demanded. He bet. He swung her onto his lit hip. He swung her onto his hip and planted a smacking kiss on her cheek. When are you going to grow up and marry me? Tomorrow! That's what you always say. This is Sibyl. Sibyl, meet Aubrey, my best girl. She pretty. Aubrey stayed in a flash of dimples. Thank you, so are you. So the dogs bumped her legs. Sibyl jolted and took a step back. Philip shot out a hand to grab her arm before she backed her way off the dock and into the water. Steady there. Says, call off the dogs. Sibyl's a little uneasy around him. They won't hurt you, Seth said with a shake of his head. The one who wants the bill, she just dropped several nauseous in his estimation. But he snagged both dogs by the collar, holding them back until she could ease by. Everybody inside, Bill Bass asked. Yeah, just taking it till dinner. Grace brought over a monster chocolate cake, Cam Sweet Top Anna, into making lasagna. God bless him. My sister-in-law's lasagna is a work of art, he told Sibyl. 
Speaking of art, I wanted to tell you again, Seth, how much I like the sketches you've done for the back boatyard. They're very good. He shrugged his shoulders and bent down to scoop up two sticks to toss to distract the dog. I just draw sometimes. Me too. She knew it was foolish, but Seth of Ale felt her cheeks go warm at the way Seth studied her, measured, and judged. It's something that I like to do in my spare time, she went on. I find it relaxes relaxing and satisfying yeah i guess maybe you'll show me more of your work sometime if you want he pushed open the door to the kitchen and headed straight to the refrigerator telling signs to bill mused he was at home here he took his quick quick scan of the room feeling impressions there was a pot simmering on what seemed to be an ancient stove the scent was impossibly aromatic several small clay pots lined the window sill of a sink fresh herbs thrived in them the counters were clean if a bit worn a pile of papers were stacked on the end beneath a wall phone anchored with a set of keys a shallow The game! I forgot! Seth slammed the refrigerator door and traced out the room. What's the score? What inning is it? Who's up? Three to two. A's bottom of the six. Two outs. A man on second. Now sit down and shut up. Very personally. He felt mad and then said all his down was when she wiggled. Baseball often becomes a personal challenge between the audience and the opposing team. Especially, spill at it with a silver nod, during the September, September pennant race. You like baseball? What's not to like, she said in a laugh. It's a fascinating study of men, of teamwork, of battle, speed, cunning, finesse, and always pitcher against batter. In the end, it all comes down to style, endurance, and mass. <laughs> We're going to have to take, a game, take in a game of Camden Yards. He decided, I just love to hear your play-by-play -play technique. Gonna get you anything. No, I'm fine. More shouts, more cursing burst out of the living room. But I think it might be dangerous to leave this room as long as your brother's team is down or run. You're perceptive. Bill reached out to curve his hand over his cheek. So why don't we stay right here and... Way to go, Kyle. Camp shouted from the living room. That son of a bitch is amazing. Shit. Seth's voice was cocky as well. No striking... No stinking California outfielder is gonna blow up... One, blow one by Ripken. Bill said it outside. Or maybe we should add it back and take a walk for a few minutes. Seth, I believe we've discussed acceptable word uses in this house. Anna, Phil, remember, coming downstairs, lay down the lot. Cameron, you're supposed to be an adult. It's baseball, sugar. If the pair of you don't watch your language, the TV goes up. <laughs> She's very strict, Phil informs him. We're all terrified of her. Really? So Bill considered, as she glanced toward the living room, she heard another voice, lower, softer than Aubrey's firm response. No, Mama, please, I want Seth. She's okay, Grace. She can stay with me. The easy absent tone of Seth's voice, and Bill considering. It's unusual, I think, for a boy Seth's age to be so patient with a toddler. Philip shrugged his shoulders, walked to the stove to start a pot of fresh coffee. They hit it off right away. Aubrey adores him. That has to boost the kid's ego, and he's really good with her. He turned, smiling, as two women walked into him. Ah, the ones who got away. So, Bill, these are the women my brother stole from me. Anna, Grace, Dr. Sibyl Griffin. He only wanted us to cook for him, Anna said with a laugh and held on hand. It's nice to meet you. I've read your books. I think they're brilliant. Taken by surprise, both by the statement and the lush and outrageous beauty of Anna Spinelli Quinn, Sabelle nearly fumbled. Thank you. I appreciate you tolerating a Sunday evening intrusion. It's no intrusion. We're delighted. And Anna thought, incredibly curious, in the seven months she'd known Philip, this was the first woman he'd brought home to Sunday dinner. Philip. Go watch baseball. She waved him toward the doorway with the back of her hand. Grace, Sibylla, and I can get acquainted. <laughs> She's bossy, too, Philip Hornsville. Just yell if you need help, and I'll come rescue you. He gave her a hard, firm kiss on the mouth, where she could think to evade it and deserted her. Anna gave a long, interesting home and smiled brightly. Let's have some wine. Grace pulled out a chip. Philip said you were going to stay in St. Chris a while and write a book about it. Something like that, Sibyl took a deep breath. They were just women, after all. A stunning, dark eyed brunette and a cool-looking blonde. There was no need to be nervous. Actually, I plan to write about the culture and traditions and social landscapes of small towns and rural communities. 
We have both on the shore. So I see. You and Ethan are recently married? Great smile, warm, and her eyes shifted to the gold band on her finger. Just last month? <laughs> and you grew up here together? I was born here. Ethan moved here when he was about 12. <laughs> are you from the area too? She asked Anna, more comfortable in the role of interviewer. No, I'm from Pittsburgh. I moved to D.C., wandered down to Princess Anne, worked for social servicer as a caseworker. That's one of the reasons I was so interested in your books. She set a glass of deep red wine in front of Sibyl. Oh, yes. You're Seth's caseworker. Philip told me a little bit about the situation. Mm hmm Was well, Anna's only comment as she turned to take a bib apron from a... Did you enjoy your sale? So Sibyl realized discussing Seth with outsiders was off limits. She ordered herself to accept that for now. Yes, very much. More than I expected to. I can't believe I've gone so long without trying it. I had my first sale a few months ago. Anna set a huge pot of water on the stove to boil. Grace has been sailing all her life. Do you work here in St. Christopher? Yes, I clean houses. Including this one, thank you. The Lord, Anna put in, I was telling Grace she ought to start a company. Mates are us or something. When Grace left, Anna shook her head. I'm serious. It would be a terrific service to the wicked working women in particularly. You could even do commercial buildings. If you've trained two or three people, we're heard of mouth along. We're getting going. You think bigger than I do. I didn't know how to run. I don't know how to run a business. I bet you do. Your family's been running the crab house for generations. Crab house, Sibyl interrupted. Picking, packing, shipping, Grace slipped in hand. Odds are, if you've had crab while you've been here, it came to you by my father's company. But I've never been involved in the business, and that doesn't mean you couldn't handle your own business. And it took a chunk of mozzarella out of the refrigerator and began to grate it. And a lot of people out there are more than willing to pay for good, reliable, and trustworthy domestic services. They don't want to spend what little free time they might have cleaning the house, cooking meals, separating laundry. Traditional roles are shifting. Don't you agree, Sibyl? Women can spend every spare second of their time in the kitchen. Women can't spend every spare second of their time in the kitchen. Well, I would agree, but, well... Here you are. Anna stopped. Blake threw back her head and laughed. She looked so built up like a woman who should be dancing around a campfire to the sound of violins rather than, than cozily grain cheese in a fragrant kitchen. You're right. Absolutely. Still chuckling, Anna shook her head. Here I am while my man lounges in front of the TV, deaf and blind to anything but the game. And this is often the scene on Sundays around here. I don't mind. I love to cook. Really? <laughs> Hearing the suspicion in Sibyl's voice, Anna laughed again. Really? I find it satisfying, but not when I have to rush him from work and toss something together. That's why we take turns around here. Mondays are leftovers for whenever I cook Sunday. Tuesday, we all suffer through whatever can cook because he's simply dreadful in the kitchen. Wednesdays, we do take out. Thursday, I cook. Friday, Philip cooks. And Saturdays are up for grabs. It's a very workable system when it works. Anna's planning on having Seth take over as chef on Wednesdays within the year. At his age? Anna shook back her hair. He'll be 11 in a couple of weeks. By the time I was his age, I could make a killer red sauce. The time and effort it takes to teach him and to convince him he's still male if he knows how to make a meal will be worth it in the end. And she had to slide wide, flat noodles into the boiling water. If I use the fact that he can outdo camp in the, any area, he'll be an A student. They don't get along. They're wonderful together. Hannah tilted her head as the living room exploded with shouts, cheers, something. And Seth likes noting nothing more than to oppress his big brother. Which means, of course, they argue and prod each other constantly. She smiled again. I take it you don't have any brothers. No. No, I don't. Sisters? Grace asked and wondered why Sibyl's eyes went cool. One... I always wanted a sister. Grace moved around. Now I've got one. Grace and I were both only children. Anna squeezed Grace's shoulder. She walked by to make some cheeses. Something in that easy, intimate gesture stirred a tug of envy inside Sibyl. Since we found in with the Quins, we've been making up rapidly for coming from small families. Does your sister live in New York? No. Sibyl's stomach clenched reflectively. We're not terribly close. Excuse me. She pushed away. Can I use the bathroom? Sure. Down the hall, first door on the left. Anna waited until Sibyl walked out and pursed her lips with grace. I can't decide what I think about her. She seems a little uncomfortable. Anna shrugged. Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see, won't we? 
In the little powder room off the hall, Sibyl splashed water in her face. She was hot, nervous, and vaguely sick to her stomach. She didn't understand this family, she thought. They were loud, occasionally crude, pieced together from different origins, yet they seemed happy, at ease with each other, and very affectionate. As she patted her face dry, she met her own eyes in the mirror. Her family had never been loud or crude, except for those ugly moments when Gloria had pushed the limits. Just now, she couldn't honestly say for certain if they had ever been happy, even been at ease with each other and affection had been and affection had been a priority or something that was expressed in an overt manner it was simple that none of them were very emotional people she told herself she had always been more cerebral out of inclination she decided in a defense against gloria's baffling vitality life was calmer and one depended on the intellect she knew that believed that absolutely but it was her emotion that motions that were turning now she felt like a lie a liar a spy a sneak Rem reminding herself that she was doing what she was doing for the welfare of a child of a child helped telling herself that the child was her own nephew and she had every right to be there to form opinions soothe objectively she told herself pressing her fingers against her temples to smother the nagging ache that's what would get her through until she gathered all the facts all the data and formed her opinion she stepped out quietly and took the few steps down the hall toward the blaring noise of the ball game she saw seth sprawled on the floor cam's feet shouting abuse to set across the room cam was gesturing with his beard and arguing the last call with philip ethan simply watched the game with robert curled in his lap dozing despite the noise the room itself was homey slightly shabby and appeared comfortable a piano was angled out from the corner a vase of zinnias and dozens of small framed snapshots crowded its polished surface a half empty bowl potato chips sat at seth's elbow the rug was littered with crumbs shoes the sunday paper and a grumpy well gnawed hunk of rope the light had faded but no one had bothered to switch on a lamp she started to speak step back but philip glanced over her smiled held out a hand she walked to him let him draw her down on the arm of his chair bottom of the ninth remember we're up by one watch this reliever kick this guy sorry ass. Seth kept his voice down, but it rang with glee. He didn't even flinch when Kane slapped him on the head with his own ball cap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Shuck him out. He leaped up to the victory booty. We are number one, man. I'm starving. He raced off to the kitchen as soon as could be heard begging for food. Winning ball games works up an appetite, Philip decided. Absolutely kissing Spill's hand. How's she doing in there? She appeared to be on top of things. Let's go see if she made any pasta. He pulled her into the kitchen, and within minutes it was crowded with people. Aubrey rested her head on Ethan's shoulder and blinked like an owl. Seth stuffed his mouth with tidbits from an elaborate tray and did a play-by-play -play of the game. Everyone seemed to be moving, talking, eating at the same time. So Bill thought Phil put another glass of wine in her hand before he was drafted to deal with the bread. Because she felt slightly less confused by him than by the others, so Bill stuck to his side as chaos reigned. He he chucked thick slices of Italian bread, then doctored them with butter and garlic. Is it always like this? He murmured to himself. No. He picked up his own glass of wine, touched it lightly to hers. Sometimes it's really loud and disorganized. By the time he drove her back to her hotel, so Bill's head was ringing. There was so much to process. Sights, sounds, personalities, impressions. She had survived completely complex state dinners with less confusion than a sunday dinner with the quins she needed time she decided to analyze when she was able to write down her thoughts her observations she would align them dis dissect them and begin to draw her initial conclusions tired she sighed once a little it was quite a day a fascinating one blew out of breath and a fattening one i'm definitely going to make use of the hotel's health club in the morning I enjoyed myself, she added as he parked near the lobby very much. Good, then you'll be willing to do it again. He climbed out, skirted the hood, then took her hand as she stepped on the curb. There's no need for you to take me up. I know the way. I'll take you up anyway. I'm not going to ask you to come in. I'm still going to walk you to your door, Sibyl. She let her go, crossing with him to the elevator, stepping inside with him when the doors opened. So you'll drive to Baltimore in the morning. She pushed the button for her floor tonight. When things are fairly settled here, I drive back Sunday nights. There's rarely any traffic, and I can get an early start on Mondays. Can't be easy for you, the commute that demands on your time and the tug of war of responsibilities. A lot of things aren't easy, but they're worth working for. I don't mind putting time and effort into something I enjoy. 
Well, she glared at dirt, walked out of the elevator the minute the doors opened. I appreciate the time and effort you put in today. We'll be back Thursday night. I want to see you. She slipped her car key card out, out of her purse. I can't be sure right now what I'll be doing at the end of the week. He simply framed her face with his hands, moved in and covered her mouth with his. The taste of her, he saw. Couldn't seem to get enough of the taste of her. I want to see you. He murmured against her lips. She always been so good at staying in control, distancing herself from a ten-cent seduction, from resisting the persuasion of physical attraction. But with him, each time she could feel herself slipping a little further, a little deeper. I'm not ready for this, she heard herself say. Neither am I. So he drew her clothes, held her tighter, and took the kiss toward des desperation. I want you. Maybe it's a good thing we both have a few days to think about what happens next. <laughs> She looked up at him, shaking, yearning, and just a little frightened of what was happening inside her. Yes, I think it's a very good thing. She turned, had to use both hands to shove the key card into his slot. Drive carefully. She stepped inside, closed the door quickly, then leaned back against it until she was certain her heart wasn't going to pump its way out of her chest. It was insane, she thought. Absolutely insane to get this involved this quickly. She was honest enough with herself, scientist enough to skew the results with incorrect data, to admit that there... That what was happening to her, where Philip Quinn was concerned, had nothing whatsoever to do with Seth. It should be stopped. She closed her eyes and felt the pressure of his mouth still vibrating on her lips. She was afraid it couldn't be stopped. End of chapter 7